Thank you everybody for being here in this colloquium. Um, I am very pleased and honored to introduce to you uh, Professor Karin Menendez del Mestre. Uh, she was born and raised in Puerto Rico uh, and she got her Bachelor in Physics from uh, McGill University in Montreal, in Canada. Uh, she was a Fulbright Fellow for a year uh, at uh, the Leiden Astronomy Institute in the Netherlands. And then she completed her PhD in astronomy at Caltech. Um, she was an astronomy and astrophysics uh, NSF uh, postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, California. Uh, and she has been professor at uh, the Balong Observatory uh, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, since 2011. 2011, oh my God, okay. <laughs> and, uh, in, in 2015, she was awarded the uh, L'Oreal UNESCO ABC Award for Women in Science in the area of physics. Uh, her re research interests uh, cover a wide range of topics uh, in extragalactic astrophysics uh, with emphasis on formation and evolution of galaxies. Uh, her main interests are uh, a panchromatic study of extreme galaxies in young and uh, in, both in the young and the distant universe, uh, indirect studies of typical galaxies in the distance universe by identifying analog populations in the nearby universe, uh, and uh, the characterization of stellar structures uh, like spiral nodes, uh, arms, bars, and bulges uh, in local galaxies. Uh, she is a mother of two young daughters, uh, and she is the uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, ambassador of the Parent in Science movement. Uh, she uh, devotes uh, energies and time towards a more inclusive and diverse scientific community. So it is my honor to uh, uh, leave the camera and microphone to Karim Menendez and Mestre. Thank you very much, uh, Rene, for the for the introduction. Uh, Rene, Sandar, everyone, thank you very much for the for the invitation. It's a it's a true pleasure uh, to 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 be with you <laughs> discussing this uh, uh, this work. Um, uh, Rene actually mentioned a few a few things that I that I work on that are not necessarily uh, associated to what I'm going to be telling you uh, about today, uh, but uh, I'm. Super happy to talk about um, other other projects too uh, of distant galaxies like dusty monsters at high redshift and stuff like that, AGNs and stuff. So uh, those are things that I, that interest me too. But I decided to to focus perhaps uh, a little bit more on on work that I'm, that has been taking a lot of my attention uh, lately, especially because I have many students working on different projects uh, related to stellar structures in in local galaxies. So. Uh, Please uh, ask, I mean, I don't know how you organize yourselves usually for questions like for the end or if you want to put them on the chat and then we can revise them afterwards or however you, um, you want to do that. But anyway, the point here is to 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 chat with you too. So I hope I'll, I'll trigger at least some, uh, some uh, questions. Uh, so yeah, Rene told, uh, said that I have been for 10 years in Observatorio Valongo. I saw a picture the other day that it popped and I was like, oh, so I have been here exactly for 10, year, 10, 10 years, so time flies by. Um, but um, anyway, so the work that, I, that I'm presenting uh, here uh, today, the, the main thing, I mean, the main motivation, uh, in fact, is kind of to, to uh, looking at, at all these great diversity of uh, structures and formats and shapes that we see in galaxies here. It's a uh, it's a really uh, beautiful poster from uh, from the SINGS uh, team uh, showing uh, galaxies in all their varieties in terms of morphology, especially here. This is like a, a, um, a representation of the Hubble uh, 24, where you have more like elliptical galaxies with this spheroidal, spheroidal uh, shapes and then spiral galaxies with without a bar and more peculiar galaxies um, Irregulars, uh, difficult to to track, uh, difficult to put a center, a pin on where the center of the galaxy is. So, the thing is, like the the local universe uh, really uh, offers a great wealth of information, uh, and and it's not just about well, it certainly is not about butter, butterfly collection and saying how beautiful these uh, images are, but uh, really this uh, understanding. The, the distribution of, uh, of stellar mass, for instance, in these galaxies, I mean, understanding what the shapes of these galaxies are, why they are like this, uh, they, they really are, uh, it's critical to understand and to be able to verify the 
how accurate uh, models of uh, galaxy formation and evolution are. They are, I mean, a local galaxy is actually the result of a whole lot of processes, astrophysical processes that happened in the past. So, so they're actually a great uh, opportunity to test all of these, um, um, all of these uh, processes that uh, construct, build uh, galaxies and spe specifically also transform galaxies. Um, the, the tricky thing, as you know, in astronomy, we don't, we don't, uh, observational astronomy, we're not like tracking stellar mass. I mean, people who do simulations have that uh, opportunity to, to track the mass. Uh, but usually when we're observing what we see is light and the transformation from light, light to mass is actually not uh, not that easy depending on the band that we're using. There are many ways of actually doing this. There are a lot of caveats and limitations. And the, the, my, my first main point uh, with this talk is going to be one that perhaps is not news to you. Uh, and, and if it is, then I, I hope I'll, I'll attract quite a bit of attention to this is the importance of going to the near infrared. So the near infrared, as, as you know, when you have a, an object, a, a galaxy, a region forming stars, if you have some uh, dust, uh, it'll actually hamper quite a bit the photons in the ultraviolet and optical that are coming out of that region. But uh, if you actually go to the infrared, then you it's actually quite uh, transparent. Uh, so the, the, the photons will actually blow out. So, in the infrared, we are able to, we're able to peer into uh, dusty regions of galaxies. And aside from this too, and I think uh, even more importantly for the talk that I'm going to be uh, that I'm going to be talking, uh, the talk that I'm going to be giving to you now, uh, that I am giving to you now, uh, is that uh, old stars. I mean, the infrared luminosity, in particular infrared, the medium infrared. Uh, the, the light from old stars is the one that actually is uh, dominating that output. So, and these old stars are the low mass, uh, low mass stars. Uh, so they, they may not individually dominate in terms of uh, mass individually. I mean, there are less massive than young massive stars, but they actually represent the, the bulk of the stellar mass uh, in galaxies. So if you actually see the distribution of old stars, which you do uh, in the mid infrared, you are actually staring at the, at the most, uh, um, uh, I have forgotten that word in English, but I mean the I guess the 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 the, the true distribution of stars uh, in galaxies. And for that, then the, there's a great interest on in actually using having access to 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 surveys that are in the infrared that are uh, uh, a lot of galaxies with all morphological types uh, represented uh, that that have a deep imaging, deep mapping of uh, galaxy outskirts. Uh, to actually understand also uh, distribution of, of stars uh, in, in the periphery of galaxies and having a homogeneity in the treatment of this data. And all of this actually is answered with this uh, survey, the Spitzer survey of stellar structures in galaxies. And this is actually a, a survey that is already, I mean, was part of the team a uh, while ago, but it's already, has, it has been since 2013 available to all of the community. So this is an invitation for you guys to go to, you guys and girls to go to uh, IRSA uh, the database, uh, infrared database to, to actually download these images, uh, value added uh, catalogs, et cetera, et cetera. So this Spitzer survey of stellar structures and galaxies or S4G as I will refer to um, uh, from now on, uh, the principal investigator is Karjit Chet. Uh, and it was one of the, the, the largest warm Spitzer missions uh, for legacy surveys. Uh, so warm Spitzer, basically uh, Spitzer ran out of cryo at some point and it was not possible to, to use the instruments, all of the instruments, but the IRAC uh, camera, so the imaging camera at the bluest bands, 3.6 uh, microns and 4.5 microns, uh, it was actually possible to, to still use them uh, in this warm Spitzer mission. It was like a revamping, a, a different, a new life for, for Spitzer. Uh, and what we did actually was uh, go after over 2,300 uh, 2, galaxies in the nearby universe. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a volume magnitude uh, size limited survey. So it basically goes out to the Virgo uh, cluster. And it is actually the largest, deepest, um, most homogeneous survey that, that is available today in the mid infrared. Uh, so it's a great, uh, a great window to understand the distribution of medium infrared light enhanced stellar mass uh, distribution 
in nearby galaxies. And this was the prime objective of this of this uh, of this survey. The the, the prime uh, motivation uh, for the collaboration was really to create the ultimate survey of the distribution of stellar structures and mass distribution within these uh, structures. So uh, just to convince you to to show you uh, in a very immediate way why. The mid infrared is such a key uh, uh, to uh, such a good window. It's really the best single base, uh, single band based um, mass, uh, stellar mass um, uh, 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 way to estimate. Uh, if you look at it here, I'm showing you uh, different uh, STDs. This is from the paper from Driver et al. from the Gamma survey. But this really very nicely shows that uh, you see the different STDs of galaxies that vary in terms of age, metallicity, extension, different models here. Um, and they have actually all been scaled down, uh, scaled uh, to the same uh, mass. So at each wavelength, the dispersion that you see, I'm actually using my hands, but uh, let me actually use the mouse, which will be more helpful to you. Uh, you can actually see that at each wave band, the dispersion is uh, is an immediate, this is all scaled to the same mass. So the, the dispersion that you see in luminosity is actually a dispersion in mass to, mass to luminosity ratio. And you can actually see that in this region, so this is the near infrared, basically here from, I've, I've, I've put more or less like between 2.5 to, to 4 or 5 uh, microns, you can actually see that the dispersion is much narrower. So the mass, luminos mass to luminosity uh, uh, ratios are actually quite constant, independent of age, metallicity, and extension. There are, of course, uh, there are some limitations, uh, but just to tell you a little bit more here, uh, this image here uh, shows uh, uh, in blue, it's the stellar, uh, the, the stellar uh, component that you have here more the stellar component, here's the dust component uh, of this elliptical galaxy and a lenticular galaxy. And you can see that uh, these four points are actually the four uh, IRAC uh, bands on Spitzer. Uh, so the 3.6 is this one here and 4.5 here. And you're really in the red gene um, uh, tail of a 2.2 uh, two, uh, 2000 Kelvin uh, uh, black body. So you're really tracing uh, the, the stellar component. However, you see if you actually go peer a little bit uh, lower here and you see in this uh, orange curve, it actually does show for this, uh, it's, it's a good um, way of illustra illustrating this, that you have uh, on the one hand, you do have some uh, contribution from very hot dust. If you have dust that is uh, hotter than uh, 500 K in, in the uh, nearby uh, NAGN, for instance, uh, you, can, you, can, you will have some of that trickling in into these bands. And also in particular, you can actually see this little blip. It's not just a blip, it's actually the 3.3 uh, pH uh, band. So this is hydro, um, a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. So if you consider dust, dust grains at the smallest end, then you actually have like uh, molecules. So these paths, these uh, carbon ring uh, molecules, uh, they have different bands. Uh, and one of them is actually at 3.3 microns. And that one actually triples into the 3.6 uh, micron band. So if you have a region of uh, um, ongoing star formation, you will have quite a bit of uh, UV photons running around there and they can actually excite the PA molecules and they can actually then, in, in, in a sense, it would be contaminating. That region could actually appear to be a little bit brighter because of those, uh, because of those, um, uh, those PA, that, that PA emission. Uh, however, it is actually not in a in a big uh, to a big degree, but I will actually come back to this uh, later. Um, but the main thing is that you can actually, uh, considering the the little dispersion that you have, uh, the the quite constant mass to light ratio that you have for different types of galaxies, you can truly use uh, the three point six micron band, uh, the mid infrared uh, in general, to to really go from light distribution to mass maps. And the specific objective that we've had, and here I'm missing a number of people who have been uh, working on the projects that I will be uh, sharing here. Uh, Marco Grossi, who actually just uh, just passed the concurso here, so he's a new professor in Valongo. We're quite happy about that. Uh, Yasmin Coelho, uh, she's an undergraduate student. Uh, Charles Signorini Gonzalez, who's also a professor, and Karjik Sheth, who continues to be a, a very a close collaborator. Uh, he's the, the PI of S4G. Uh, but our main interest actually has been uh, lately to really establish uh, what what the uh, stellar mass content is in different 
um, uh, stellar structures uh, bulge this uh, bars. And in order to do that, what we do is take advantage of what we had done as part of the S4D team that we did for the community. So all of that is actually available to you, but here the reference is uh, Salo 2015. Um, you can, uh, what we did for all of the galaxies uh, in S4G was take the, uh, the image, you, you have the original image, and we ran this uh, ideal wrapper with Galfit. Galfit is a tool uh, to decompose uh, galaxies into different components. And here, the example that I'm showing you here, uh, the model includes a bar, a bulge, a disk. And here, if you actually just take that original image and you subtract the total model, which is what I'm showing you here, you're left with uh, a residuals in such a way that you can also uh, not only study how much light is in the bar, in the bulge, in the disk, but you can also see how much, uh, how much light is actually remaining uh, in these spiral arms, for instance. But there are other, other uh, components that actually are taken into account in this, in this one specifically not, but uh, there's the nucleus too, a nuclear source, which basically is just a point source that could be an AGN, could be, could be a, a star cluster, it's just a point source in the center. But what we do uh, then is actually um, verify and see well, what percentage of the light is associated, associated to each component and using this uh, uh, ben benefiting from the fact that we're actually looking at the 3.6 band uh, and 4.5, we can actually determine how much mass is in each of these components. And also uh, something that we're actually looking into is looking at these residual images to look at how much mass is also in the spiral arms, disks, uh, 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 rings, uh, this, this work we actually have not yet uh, started. But um, um, we have focused uh, our, our projects uh, on things that are interesting, but they're not just interesting because oh, we think it's cool. But for instance, we, we're looking at uh, dwarf galaxies. Uh, dwarf galaxies, I mean, they may be like super cool for some people uh, or, or not. But the fact is, independently of what you, whether you think they're cool or not, they dominate in number the local universe. So they're actually key to understand uh, galaxy, uh, galaxy formation, galaxy evolution. And lately, especially, we have been uh, hearing a lot about dwarf galaxies and intermediate black holes in their centers and other things, interesting things. But uh, dwarf galaxies, they dominate in number. So they may not dominate in terms of uh, mass. They're the puniest galaxies. These are galaxies usually, uh, the cut is usually less than 10 to the nine for masses. Um, but uh, here I'm just showing you two examples from, uh, from the SPG. Uh, with a, a 3.6 uh, microns. Uh, if we consider massive galaxies, then most of the massive galaxies nearby, then they're were dominated by the spiral uh, morphology. This changes naturally when we consider higher redshift. Uh, as we go into higher redshift, then we can actually uh, see that there's a greater um, contribution from, I mean, the irregular, peculiar galaxies, galaxies that are messed up for one reason or the other, either because they're interacting, they're asymmetric, uh, the different, different levels of peculiarity. Uh, and at that point, then the spirals, uh, the spiral morphology does not, is not as dominant as, as it is uh, locally. But um, what, what we do observe uh, is that also uh, one of the stellar structures that are most commonly found in the galaxies that dominate in terms of morphology, the local universe is a, is a bar. So stellar bars are present in approximately two thirds of all galaxy of all spiral galaxies. And this we have actually known since the Vakular. So we've actually, we have actually been sitting in this information for a very long time. I mean, we have, we're already uh, reaching the 50 years, uh, no, 60 years, sorry. Uh, and this was based on optical bands. And we have actually looked at this also at, at different bands and there's a motivation uh, uh, for this, but just let's say, you know, bars here, I'm showing you two examples. The bar is this like, rectangular like uh, structure that cuts across the center of this galaxy. Uh, and here we have a really beautiful, the 1097 is a beautiful galaxy. I use it for my, the, the first uh, slide too. Um, so with this uh, nice uh, uh, spiral arm, but you can also see uh, this bar, although it, it does not stand out as much uh, to the eye in this flock length uh, spiral, it is clearly present there. Um, and the interest in bars is that bars really, they, they really know how to mess up their, their host galaxy. So here I'm, I'm just showing a, um, a simulation that uh, uh, shows the kind of gas motions that you have 
uh, in the bar, the bar will actually move gas and stars around the, towards the center uh, within the co-rotation radius towards uh, the outer regions uh, beyond there. And this can actually have an impact on the metallicity gradient across the galaxy, although there has been uh, still uh, the smoking gun for this. Uh, we thought we had it, but then Khalifa, Khalifa work has actually uh, shown a little bit of, uh, of um, uncertainty as to whether this is really the case, but it makes sense. I mean, things have been moved around, so the metallicity gradient being changed by, by the bar is something that we actually expect to. Uh, the gas being funneled to the center may actually be, uh, um, um, increases the molecular gas in the center and can trigger also starburst. And this it has also been called into, into uh, as, a, as a great candidate to move uh, gas towards the center, even feeding an AGN. Although we now know that a primary bar, the bars that we usually see would not be, uh, they would not be able to do this uh, on their own because the scales are very different. But perhaps nuclear nuclear bars or uh, uh, um, a set of different bars would actually be able to do this. But basically, bars when they're there, I mean, they can really transform their hosts. So they are actually key to understand um, the, many of the processes that are uh, going on in galaxies, and they're everywhere. I mean, we see in two thirds of uh, of the of the spirals, we see a bar. And we have a, uh, uh, there was in the 80s and 90s, uh, there was a, an interest in actually looking uh, in the near, in the near infrared, in, in fact, uh, with more infrared uh, uh, surveys, it, it became uh, interesting that uh, some galaxies, for instance, this one that I'm showing you here, NGC 1068, does not necessarily in the optical strike you as a, doesn't really strike you as a barred galaxy, but if you look at it in the, in the infrared, and this was where Brad was um, it, it actually does show very nicely this bar. So the question was like, are all bars, uh, are all galaxies barred and we just need to look in the right band? And it kind of makes sense a little bit, the, the, the question as I'll tell you in a moment, galaxies do like this, they like forming bars, but also the fact that bars, they're, they're stellar structures. So obviously they do, they do disappear, appear depending on what uh, age, uh, the, the stellar populations that compose uh, bars. And they are actually older, uh, they're composed of older stars. So what we, uh, this, uh, this image that I'm showing you here actually is, uh, shows this, uh, this bar, uh, this barred galaxy in the I band. So that's the reddest band that I'm showing you here in B band uh, in the optical and the UV. And you can actually see how it completely disappears in the UV. So we can, we, it actually made sense the idea, well, if a few cases, when we look at them in the infrared, they actually, we have some bars popping up. Perhaps all bars are, are all, all galaxies are bar. We just need to look in the right uh, band. And this motivated work uh, with the two mass uh, survey, the two micron all sky survey using the large galaxy atlas. So that, that was, uh, it, it had a few hundred uh, uh, spirals to actually look into this. This was part of my uh, PhD work. And what we found was that the, the bar fraction, it was kind of a perhaps anticlimactic in the sense that it was not, it, it did not seem uh, to change much from the optical to the near infrared. I mean, we could actually see more clearly some bars, perhaps characterize them more easily, but we, we do not actually uh, change very much the bar fraction when we go from the optical to the near infrared. And this was actually quite exciting because uh, it, it invited uh, the, the use of the tons of HST um, rest frame optical, so optical to near infrared, um, to be able to look at the rest frame optical of galaxies out to redshift of 0.8. And this was uh, safe from band shifting effects. So we would not be losing bars uh, because we were looking in the, in the rest frame UV, which was initially, the, there were a few calls about not having bars in the distant universe because we were actually, we used uh, just optical bands uh, optical filters, and we would simply be looking at the UV, and we would actually be losing bars. But this, uh, there was this really nice work uh, by um, a co no, sorry, <laughs> it was Kartik, uh, Kartik uh, and collaborators, um, where they actually see just very briefly. It's just the the bar fraction as a function of redshift. This is all based on HST rest frame optical, so it is using uh, ACS uh, data uh, with pick two uh, with with three. Uh, so tracing out to the near infrared, but always staying to the rest uh, to the rest frame I band, if I'm, I'm mistaken. 
Uh, and what we actually see, as I'm, I'm very subtly uh, indicating with this arrow, is that we see a drop in the bar fraction uh, for different measures, looking at the, at the bar fraction, the strong uh, bar fraction or the total bar fraction. But this, uh, uh, more than this, additionally, uh, something that was uh, quite interesting was that I, um, in this, and I'm showing you here from this same work, they looked at, is there a question? If there are questions, you can ask, but I'm, I, I thought I heard a, a mic. Uh, so this is the bar fraction as a function of uh, stellar mass. And so here it's basically the, the high end and the different curves in red, in blue, and in, red, in, in black, uh, it's actually tracing the bar fraction at different redshifts. So this is the, the highest, the, the, the red curve is showing the bar fraction as a function of mass only for the most distance, uh, distant galaxies in the sample. So this is relative between 0.6 and 0.84. Uh, the blue curve shows again, the bar fraction as a function of mass, but for this intermediate uh, relative sample and locally, so at relative uh, zero, this is based on, uh, I think it's basically all uh, SDSS. Uh, this black uh, curve is also a bar fraction as a function of mass. And if you actually just focus here on the high end, all these uh, with, uh, with the error bars that you, that you see here, all of these uh, uh, tend to indicate that uh, the, at the highest mass, uh, mass end, the um, galaxies already had their bars at higher relative. So there was not much growth of bars in, at the high mass end, but most of the growth actually happens at the low mass end. So this, um, we're not, they were not actually tracing down to lower masses to include us all uh, dwarf galaxies, uh, this actually goes down to 10 to the 10. Beyond that, they were not uh, complete, uh, but they actually then uh, were able to look at, uh, to, to, to note that there was this downsizing in structure formation. I remember this, uh, the excitement to actually see that all of this action is actually happening in this uh, low stellar mass systems. And this, um, Coming back, I, I mentioned that uh, galaxy disks, they like forming bars, obviously. And coming back to this, this is based on uh, simulation work. Uh, so many, here I'm showing you uh, very classical. This is uh, uh, Spark and Selwood, uh, 1987, uh, showing uh, uh, a simulation. But there's a lot of work that has been done by Atanat Sula and collaborators. And basically what they point to is that a disk will naturally form a bar in a giga year, in a billion years, unless it has certain conditions that are uh, making it not be uh, hospitable to the bar instability. So the galaxy disk will not succumb to the bar instability if it is too hot dynamically. And this, we're talking about the sigma over, over V. So too, too turbulent, you could uh, think of it in that way too. If it's particularly rich in gas, this was worked by Atanasula in 2013, Atanasula and collaborators in 2013. And by very rich in gas, uh, it's higher than 50%, 60%. So this is very gas rich. Or if it's centrally dominated by a, uh, by a dark, dark matter, um, it, it has to do with the, 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 the exchange of angular momentum with the, with the different components in the galaxy. So basically, if there's a bar or there's not a bar, it's not a matter. I mean, it can be difficult to convince somebody that does not necessarily immediately care about bars. It's like, well, it has a bar, it doesn't have a bar. What does it do? What does it matter? But it actually tells us something about the, the disk maturity. So it tells us that it's sufficiently uh, cool dynamically. So it's not it's not that uh, turbulent. So in a, in a sense, is and if we consider that galaxies, they acquire their bars and they're acquiring their bars, the ones that are at lower mass, uh, still, it really shows us uh, the presence of a bar actually says that the galaxy um, has the conditions to allow for a bar to form. So it really, just looking at the shape, just looking at the presence of this uh, stellar structure tells us much about the formation history of this uh, galaxy. So that this has actually been uh, uh, a great motivation to actually just in general look at uh, look at bars. So we we what we seek is insight to the galaxy's history of mass assembly. So we want to know how much mass is in these uh, stellar uh, structures. And this is work led by, uh, by Yasmin Coelho and her little one who has been helping her a lot through the pandemic <laughs> by being a really nice little boy and letting her mom, uh, his mom work. <laughs> 
uh, or not. But anyway, so uh, she is an excellent uh, student. And what we did first, uh, she focused uh, on the S4G sample, just taking all of the bars in massive spirals. Uh, and the massive, uh, by massive, I mean just greater than 10 to the nine uh, solar masses, because basically we, do, we, did, we took uh, later also the dwarf galaxies for less than 10 to the nine. So for the batch of higher than stellar, uh, than 10 to the nine stellar uh, uh, solar uh, masses, uh, we also make a cut in inclination, basically because we need to be able to see if there's a bar or there's not a bar. And if it's too edge on, we're not able to actually see if there's a bar. Um, and this actually came out to be 365 uh, bars out of the sample. We did not do this uh, by, by eye. We used the, the 2D decomposition that I showed you earlier. So here is an example of three uh, massive uh, galaxies with their uh, models. You can actually see in this case, there's a disk and a bar. In this case, there's a disk, a bar, and maybe you cannot see it because it's a very dark blue, but it's a nucleus. And here it's a bulge disk and a bar. We can actually see here uh, the residuals with some black spots, which are the correspond to the mass. Um, but then what she what she actually set out to do was actually look at how much uh, matter, how much uh, mass, stellar mass is contained in the bar component, in the different components too. But I'm going to just focus here for the moment, telling you about the bar. So the first thing is we find um, uh, we find that uh, uh, the bar uh, comprises more, more or less, there's a variation as, as I'm showing you here. The different colors actually show different kinds of uh, decompositions for the galaxies. So there are some galaxies that are found to be well adjusted, well fit um, by a disk and a bar. Uh, others are, are better adjusted by including also a nucleus. Uh, the, this uh, green one also includes a bulge and the orange one uh, has a, a smaller uh, histogram here. Uh, that also includes a nucleus. But what we see is uh, the whole distribution, the median is around 10%. Uh, so, I mean, a little bit lower, actually, more like 7%. Seven, uh, 7 and we actually see an intriguing, uh, we're, we're still uh, looking into this, uh, but we actually see this, this curves have actually just put them there to guide your eye. And you can actually see that the curve, the distribution for the, uh, the green and the orange histogram, they're actually set, they do have like a more important tail or a median that actually is dislocated from, from the other ones. And these are actually the, these colors are the ones that correspond to, gal to, correspond to galaxies that have a bulge. So it kind of uh, suggests that perhaps we're seeing more, uh, more massive. Uh, so this is relative, uh, relative uh, mass. We may actually be seeing more uh, relative mass in galaxies that have a bulge. So perhaps they're like more mature galaxies. We're still looking into, the, into this, but it actually seems uh, like something that struck our eye when we actually saw this, this is still all of, all of this actually a work in progress. Um, we also looked and, and, and here we had the contribution also, also from Marco Grossi, who's an expert on dwarf galaxies. We looked at the um, S4G dwarf galaxies. So looking at uh, a sample of 340 or less, uh, dwarf galaxies from the S4G sample, uh, picking out first the ones that actually did have uh, a bar because most of them actually of the uh, dwarf galaxies and in, in our sample, this sample of nearby galaxies, uh, actually they're well fit by a disk uh, and sometimes in this, this case a nucleus, but already 65% were just simply well fit by a disk. And no other uh, component uh, seemed to be uh, necessary. And here I'm showing you in 2D, this is in 1D, you can actually see the profile. The, in green here it's a nucleus, in red is the disk, component here is the data and you can actually see here just that uh, that's already the, the sky. What we find is that there are only 11% of the bars that uh, of the dwarf galaxies that host the bar. So this is significantly less than what we see in massive galaxies. In massive galaxies, I had told you before, it's like two thirds so the number varies a little bit between 60, 67%. Um, but for, for dwarf galaxies, we're finding much lower uh, bar fraction. And this is actually, it's, uh, there, there was a, a work uh, by Peter Irwin in 2018, who also looked and, uh, at this, at the bar fraction as a function of, of masses. And he also finds um, these low, uh, low values for dwarf galaxies. And this actually fits really nicely with what I was just telling you about how we see this downsizing uh, in stellar structure where we see that at the highest redshifts and the lowest redshifts, if you compare all of these data points at the high mass end, all the bar massive gas galaxies already had their bars 
the all the excitement is actually happening in the in the low mass uh, galaxies, lower mass galaxies, so uh, lower than ten to the ten ten point five, ten to the ten, as this uh, plot shows. And what we're actually probing is actually even lower masses than this. So the low fraction we measure for low mass galaxies uh, is consistent with the trend that low mass galaxies are still in the process of forming their bars. But something struck us when we actually looked at the relative mass containing these bars, because we actually find that they're very similar. I mean, they, they seem to be just, they seem to contain pretty much the same amount of gas, um, sorry, the, the same amount of, uh, of stellar mass, not in absolute terms, but in relative terms as massive galaxies. So these are dwarf galaxies. So we would have expected in a certain way that, that there would be less mass also associated, less relative mass, because these are perhaps bars that are in process of formation, in process of growth. Uh, but it may be, and this is something that we are very intrigued about and we need to think about, we're looking into this, that this the bar relative mass seems to be independent of the, of the galaxy mass. So it, it could be attached to some underlying physics uh, that concerns the, the, the actual bar instability. So we, we need to look and think about this, but this is actually something that uh, has been has been keeping us uh, entertained, trying to understand. Um, now, as Monty Python would say, for something completely different, but not that much because it's still using the decomposition. Uh, we had, um, this is somebody that René actually uh, spent some time also with when he was here in, in Valongo, uh, in Rio de Janeiro. This is Via Ramos who has since, uh, for she, has, uh, she left after astronomy and she left us with this beautiful project that we need to finish. Uh, but it's very exciting, so I'll tell you about it. Uh, she focused on also looking at the 3.6 micron uh, images uh, from S4G. She focused on early type galaxies. So these are basically, these are uh, mostly ellipticals and lenticulars uh, and, and some lenticulars. And the idea was to look at uh, those that actually exhibit some sort of peculiarity because usually we think about ellipticals, no gas, uh, hardly any dust, uh, no star formation, not much at least. So there's just like these boring quiescent systems, but we know they're not. And, and what we actually uh, had seen in some preliminary work with S4G, we had seen that 17% uh, of ETGs of early type galaxies, if we did a, um, um, uh, oh, the mask, I forgot, I forgot the expression right now, but uh, mask subtraction, basically you take a very smooth out version of, of, the, of the image, and you, uh, on sharp masking, okay, I remembered. Uh, we actually see when we take out this very smooth um, uh, component, you can actually see uh, that there are shells uh, and some like uh, uh, tied uh, tails, things that you would not expect in, this, in these galaxies. And this is an excellent example. It has been known for a long while. I mean, this credit goes to, to, to the CFHT. Uh, image of this beautiful galaxy 04, NGC uh, 474, uh, where you can actually see that there's a lot of shells and a lot of uh, non-boring stuff happening with this galaxy. Well, Bia, what she did was she, she used uh, this work actually by Taeyun Kim uh, from the S4G collaboration had been based only in about 60 galaxies, but Bia actually extended that to the whole S4G uh, database. And she not only looked at how many of these galaxies uh, had a uh, substructure looking at the 3.6 uh, micron image, which is here the same galaxy that I'm showing you here as an example. But she actually went ahead and did the decomposition uh, using uh, galaxy imaging and the, the whole uh, SDSS U grids uh, data and uh, adjust going, going ahead and doing a CD feeding of the considering the light in these uh, substructures. Uh, so this is actually something that we had known already for a while that we had these galaxies, but we did not have uh, the, 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 the mid-infrared uh, anchor to actually know how much mass there is in these in this, uh, residuals. And what you find is that the substructures, they, they comprise uh, not more than 10%, but actually it, become, it starts to become uh, quite important. It's not something that is negligible. And, and looking at the stellar population analysis that she did, uh, it is actually consistent with the star forming event that happened uh, one, two, three uh, billion years ago. So this is an agreement with shell persistence um, timescales. These are not events that just happened. There's no star formation 
ongoing in these shells that I'm that I'm showing you here, but they're persisting. I mean, they're they're actually uh, slowly fading away. And the different different works that we have been doing, they they very much look at morphology and the presence of stellar structures, specific stellar structures, trying to understand how much mass it's in this, uh, but always trying to connect them to the, to the processes and the, the galaxy formation um, history. And we have, um, we have been looking at, uh, I mean, the, the, the motivation is actually to connect these galaxy shapes uh, to past events. And we have been lo uh, looking to at, the, um, at uh, using information based on, on spectra in this case, looking at specific uh, indicators that can tell us something about the star formation uh, uh, past, act uh, past activity. And what we do is actually look at the, uh, the 4,000 uh, 4, Armstrong break and the H delta uh, absorption. This is just to, to show you, this is work that has been uh, based on, on a technique that was first uh, put forward using these indices by Kaufman. I mean, they have been introduced before, but the technique was uh, by uh, Martin 2007, uh, Gonzalez 2012, and it has continued to, to, to provide uh, very nice uh, work. But basically is using these uh, different indices they can uh, allow us to distinguish between a faster or slower quenching through the Green Valley. So basically, if we consider galaxies has been divided, I mean, they can be, uh, they can be divided pretty much in terms of like uh, color. You have the blue cloud galaxies that are actively forming stars. And at some point, they can use up their gas. And the, the natural understanding is that they use the, up their gas and they can either slowly or rapidly, depending on what's making them move towards the red. Uh, sequence, they, bec they become quiescent galaxies. But as they are going from blue to red, they're actually traversing this, uh, cutting across this uh, so-called green valley. And we use specifically the passage through this uh, region to, to pin down the timescales um, uh, of this uh, passage. And here, this is work by uh, Jean Noguera Cavacancho. He was a, a, a PhD student of mine. And what he did was actually uh, use uh, Z cosmos, so the spectral uh, spectra of uh, uh, galaxies in the cosmos field. So these are intermediate uh, redshift uh, galaxies at uh, redshift of 0.8 approximately. So basically just putting them together to, uh, it was not possible, the resolution was not sufficiently, um, the signal to noise, sorry, was not sufficiently good to actually do it for individual galaxies, only for, for a few that were also in the legacy uh, sample. But uh, what he did was actually uh, get um, um, representations for all of these uh, different uh, morphologies for elliptical galaxies, on bar galaxies, strong bars, irregular disks, weak bars, and merging galaxies. And this is um, what he what he finds basically is uh, he looks at the quenching time scale as a function of morphology. And what we see is uh, we have uh, the passage through the Green Valley actually is quite uh, rapidly compared uh, in, in, in these morphologies, like when we're associating the morphology we're looking at, it's more associated to uh, symmetries, uh, interactions, uh, big mergers or ellipticals. And just, just to note, these images are from the local, from, from our low relative galaxies. These are just to give you a sense of what we mean by a merger but these are actually galaxies at bridge of 0.8. The, the data points arise from, uh, from galaxies at bridge of 0.8. And you can actually see then that this uh, process that actually take galaxies through the Green Valley uh, at time scales that are uh, significantly lower, uh, more so faster uh, than uh, galaxies that are associated to these morphologies like unbarred, weakly barred and barred galaxies. Uh, with an, in an interest, uh, particularly in the barred galaxies, because strongly barred galaxies, basically what we know is that they are they're long-lived structures, bars. So nothing actually has happened. Nothing too sudden has actually happened to these galaxies. So they're actually just slowly carrying through, carrying on through the Green Valley. But I'm, I'm checking here the, the time. Okay. Uh, and we we actually moved forward. Uh, there was a really nice work by Camila de Safreta. She's a, she was a master's, master's student of uh, Dr. Chago uh, Gonzalez. And he uh, she's now doing her PhD in, in, at ESO. 
gashing. And what she actually, uh, she increments, she, she, the, the, the technique that had been actually, that I just described to you, they actually work a little bit more to actually consider not only blue galaxies becoming red galaxies by using up the gas, but considering the possibility of actually having galaxies that are bursting. And what she actually finds is that uh, roughly like 40, uh, depending on the mass, 40, 45% of spirals are actually uh, these bursting spirals. So you have galaxies, uh, spiral galaxies also going in a, in a different direction. So from red to blue. In the case of ellipticals, it's low, it's 20, 25%, depending on the mass. Um, and the, the, in, in the case of uh, spiral galaxies, this uh, y-axis is associated to the asymmetry uh, in presenting these galaxies. And you can actually see that um, the asymmetry does seem to have too much to do to to do with uh, with the in the case of uh, spiral galaxies that are bursting. Not so much in the case of uh, of ellipticals. But basically, what uh, what they put forward is uh, whereby the Safredes, uh, uh, Gonzalez and and collaborators, what we find is that uh, on on the one hand we do know okay, galaxies is the blue, green, and red. They're representing the region for the blue cloud. The green valley and the red red sequence. So the idea is that you have galaxies that will actually go from blue uh, to red. They will lose their gas. But what this uh, actually offers, then it provides uh, a additional path. So we know that uh, roughly, like uh, in spirals, are like 40, 45 percent of the spirals are actually in the green valley that are actually going the other direction. So there is a symmetries interaction, something that is actually making these galaxies go burst again. So they're actually being uh, in the case we usually say rejuvenated when we're talking about ellipticals, because you, you can have the ellipticals being rejuvenated via uh, minor mergers and then contributing to the, to the flow uh, back towards the red sequence. But this, this is all connecting morphology with galaxy processes. However, morphology is tricky. Morphology can be misleading depending on what band uh, you're looking at. And here is a... a uh, paper that I'm that I'm working on that we should be uh, it'll be my pandemic paper I hope um, but then it's uh, it's looking at the properties of bars uh, here I'm showing you for this uh, for this galaxy we look at it in in different bands so this in the in the optical uh, in the B band R band and at 3.6 so in the medium infrared and what we actually see if we actually trace this is fitting ellip ellipses to the iso uh, to the isophotes of the galaxy in the 2D in, in, in the image. You can actually see this increase. This is recognized as an image uh, as a bar signature. You have an increase, monotonic increase in, in ellipticity, and then a sudden drop. And basically, you have your galaxies first being um, it's pretty roundish and close to the center. Say there's a bulge, and as it's tracing the the bar, it becomes more elliptical, and then it'll actually become rounder again for to trace the the disk and this is what you're actually seeing and what we uh the way that we characterize um there are many ways of characterizing this but the length and the strength of a bar is associated to how thin the bar is so the ellipticity it reaches at a maximum and also at what point this maximum ellipticity is reached so this uh this actually characterizes the length and you can actually see here from this plot that uh as you go bluer the bar actually will actually uh, the the bar will be measured to be longer, and the reason why we why we see that is uh is we understand that uh, oftentimes you'll see uh, uh, knots of star formation at the edges of bars, and as you go on to bluer bands, this uh, these knots of star formation will actually become more prominent and will actually stretch out the uh, ellipticity signature out to um, a longer length distance from the from the center and here just to to for for your eye to catch this because it's not that I've exaggerated the 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 impact here of why we also see them thinner and it's because when you consider redder bands the the bulge is actually more prominent in 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 redder bands it's composed of old stars of older stars so the way that we actually measure how thin a bar is, it has not taken out the bulge from the center. So the bulge ends up kind of crowding, um, uh, limiting how thin you can measure that bar to be. And this is an effect of 20, 25%. Um, so this is actually something that uh, opens, um, opens the door. It actually uh, tells us that band shifting does matter. It may not matter to determine whether there's a bar or if it's not, as I told you before, the bar fraction does not change unless you go into the restaurant movie. 
but in the bar properties, it seems we need to be a little bit more careful. So this actually tells us uh, a bit, I mean, I can tell you, I can tell, talk to you a little bit more. I'm gonna skip it now, but exciting prospects to look at the growth of bars uh, with JWST. So this is something that we'll be in a, in a position to do with predictions from, from simulations. Um, but just uh, showing you quickly, uh, just displaying uh, some uh, uh, work that has been done by the group here, specifically by Ariana Cortesi. Uh, she's also a postdoc in the, in the group and she has been uh, very involved. I mean, we are too, but she, she has been the leader of uh, this work on lenticular galaxies specifically, uh, looking at multi-filter surveys, uh, JPAS, S plus here, I'm showing you uh, for S plus, uh, but probing for changes in morphology, morphological parameters as a function of wave band and the importance of actually looking at the different stellar populations. And something that we have uh, been putting a lot of time into and a lot of effort uh, lately has been on this uh, new survey that we started in 2018, is the census of Austral nearby galaxies, Kanga, to Rene or anyone who has come to Rio that will actually mean something. It's the, 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 the not the towel, but the piece of uh, syringe that you will actually stretch on the beach to go to the beach here. Well, Kanga survey is actually the, we've actually, we are going after all s g galaxies reachable from the south. Uh, so we're talking here about uh, a thousand, a thousand, a hundred galaxies, a thousand, one hundred galaxies uh, that that we're actually surveying, imaging with the grease bands using the Goodman instrument on, on, on SOAR. Here's a, Camila, when she went to, to observe, we have the, our students, a lot of remote observing has been happening too. And we actually go down to the same depth that I actually didn't mention to, to uh, of S4G, because it's really the deepest, s is the deepest uh, mid infrared uh, imaging uh, survey that you have. Uh, it's, uh, it goes down to one uh, solar mass per parsec square. And we're actually going down uh, to the same. So here are the, the, the actual uh, magnitudes. So this largely surpasses what uh, SDSS, uh, the imaging sensitivity it has. SDSS has been fantastic and we're trying to see if we can actually um, uh, expand on the work, the wonderful work that has been done in the North to actually extend this work to, to speci especially uh, galaxy outskirts where we cannot do uh, this kind of work. And here is just comparing with uh, some uh, uh, patches of the sky have been uh, imaged by the DES, by the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, they actually look at the uh, same bands, not, not, not the same uh, areas necessarily, but here are a few where we, we, we point inside, each point is a galaxy, and you can actually see that we go uh, significantly deeper at the GRI bands. The Z band, we actually stay uh, less, uh, less time, they actually stay, uh, the DES uh, collaboration decided to stay the same amount of time in each of their bands, so they're naturally, they have a better way of, of tracing uh, uh, they go deeper in terms of mass when, when they consider only Z, but we actually do, uh, do carry the weight for GRI. And uh, with the same conditions that we're actually looking, we're, we're tracing uh, subgalactic uh, uh, structures in, in galaxies out to 40 megaparsecs. So that's really what we're going after. And we have looked at bar green dwarf galaxies, lenticulars, and now we're actually looking at uh, Milky Way analogs doing this kind of uh, um, of mapping and stellar population analysis for all the galaxies. Uh, so uh, providing uh, stellar mass and star formation mass maps uh, using uh, LeFar and Sigal. And this is work that uh, has been led now for, by this undergraduate student at Anael Gomez de Oliveira. Uh, this is VIVA survey. So this is uh, H1, 21 centimeter. And this is a, a galaxy in S4G, um, a pretty face on uh, spiral. And what he's doing, actually, we've been looking at uh, Milky Way analogs with the angle. The, if we have a very careful, this Viva, actually H1, will give us the dynamic uh, mass uh, uh, through the galaxy. And we, if we, with a very careful stellar mass distribution mapping, which we believe we have in hand with a combination of S4G and Kanga, remember that PAH, and limitations of S4G were with Kanga by looking at the stellar population, by making a full uh, stellar population analysis, we actually can break this, uh, this degeneracy and actually provide really nice mapping uh, for the mass. The idea is to isolate and actually be able to estimate, provide a better, uh, more realistic um, uh, example of the halo that our own galaxy has 
uh, with the idea of providing, uh, of estimating local dark matter uh, density uh, in the solar vicinity, just based on what we see in other galaxies, with the idea of providing uh, experiments on direct dark fish. And we're, we've started to have some collaboration with people in Portugal from, from the LZ uh, collaboration. But this is uh, just very exciting work. But the take home message basically here is like, Mass characterization, if you want to look at stellar mass, and you do when you want to look at, uh, understand how stellar structures tell you something about the past of a galaxy, you need to look at the mass. Uh, the infrared is a way to, to actually look at this. Uh, the, the mass to light ratio is pretty constant for all types of galaxies uh, with some limitations that we're actually, you can actually break when, we, when you use also uh, multiband uh, studies to look at the stellar population. Um, S4G data is for all to you. So everything that I've shown you, the 2D composition is for you to invent and go ahead and do your wonderful projects or come and talk to me and, and we can work together too. I like working with nice people. So, so it's always uh, good to, to create new collaborations. And with Kanga, we don't only uh, stress, um, we'll be tracing the mass as we would with S4G, but we actually can do a mapping and understand, you know, um, formation history of a galaxy at subgalactic scale. So pixel by pixel. So this is actually very exciting work. And if you know of uh, anyone that is interested, we have postdoc opportunities. It's kind of a dire moment for Brazil uh, in terms of uh, uh, the pandemic and all that, but just waiting for a little bit, things will get better and we have postdoc opportunities. So if you know of any people who are interested or you yourself, just reach out and, and we can talk. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Karen. Thank you. Okay, let's see some hands for questions. Uh, Kike, did you have a question or was that an accidental push? Okay, Kike, go ahead. So, hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can. I, I, well, I think my camera is not working. Uh, Okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, thank you. Very nice talk. I am a really enthusiastic of uh, galaxy morphologies and stuff. I I have only one question. It's just for curiosity. Is it possible to use mm -hmm. this uh, this S4G to measure I don't know like uh, angular momentum profiles or something in these bars? Um, I know. So a lot of I, I only talked about a very simple yet popular way that we use to 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 measure like the strength of a bar and all and, and all that it's something that you can really carry to high relative that's why i only focus on this one but um i know that there's work by uh, you may be familiar with a uh, laurikainen uh salo so there's there's a whole bunch of people also buddha david blog i mean there, there are many other works that have actually been looking at the uh, they yeah. they 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 use uh, these images to do that kind of measure. I haven't actually done it uh, myself. I, I'm a big believer on, on using methodologies that can be applied to uh, different circumstances, like high redshift, that where you would not necessarily have the same, the same uh, uh, signal to noise, et cetera. But it's not because it's not worth it. I mean, it actually does trace more accurately the, the strength and all that. So there, there are people who have actually been doing this. Uh, I haven't seen it on uh, using the, the mid infrared, but I believe that they, because they do Fourier decomposition and they associate it somehow. I don't, I don't know the details, but if any of the, I, I, I think you did, uh-huh. When I said some of the authors that I, they, they do use, uh, um, the composition analysis and they somehow associated to to that. So there's this QB, the Q strands, the different ways that they they decompose to be able to reach out of what the strength of the bar is in another way of measuring it. The ellipticity is actually correlates with those uh, measures, but uh, it has been shown that it has limitations. So especially when you want to trace the really um, uh, uh, the stronger bars, the LTC kind of saturates. It's difficult. I, and, and there, I think I'm referring to some figures from uh, Eya Laurikainen's work. I, oh, okay. I can write it write down to if, if those words didn't mean too much, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the authors, but, but yeah, good question, yeah. Okay, well, just curious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kike. Thanks, Kike. Uh, Bernardo?
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm and Karin. I can see you. Good. Hi. <laughs> nice <laughs> to meet you, Karin. I, I, I know nice that some you. of your papers for, for a long time. I like very much the ah. S4G sample. Yeah, um, it's pretty and, cool sample. And you can yes. use it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I've been trying to, and I've been talking with uh, uh, Heiki and Simon Diaz about ah, okay. this mm -hmm. sample. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I'm curious about one of your results, uh, okay. the one regarding the the stellar fraction, the stellar mass fraction of bars uh, over the total mass for mm -hmm. uh, low mass and high mass for galaxies. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. they are the same. We're we're measuring. The, okay, I I can just uh, show you quick. Can you still see my presentation? I don't yes. know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Just to show you, I mean, you, you could argue, ah, oh, so one is like more like 7%, the other one is like 8%, but oops, sorry, well, I'm trying to get there. Yeah, but more or less, uh, but but the, basically the same. No? Yeah, that's why, because I mean, the, the here is for, for dwarf galaxies, and note there are very few dwarf galaxies. So it, it uh, we have, uh, I mean, the bar fraction is quite low for bars, so it could be that we're dealing with uh, uh, low, uh, small number statistics. Uh, and you can actually see uh, here, this is for, for massive uh, galaxies, but here we're counting, I mean, these are more than 300 bars that we're looking at. But we were very surprised at the beginning, I mean, even admitting here, when we did it, we ran things and we're like, no, 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 we were doing something wrong. We're convincing ourselves that we needed to find something less because it kind of made sense. They're still forming bars in the dwarf galaxies, so we expected something less. Uh, actually, uh, we in a rush to present for a conference, uh, we, <laughs> my student, she got involved with uh, some, I don't know, she was trying to, to use something and she, she, we thought at the beginning that there were less, uh, the relative mass was less for dwarf galaxies. Mm -hmm. But when we did things more carefully and we looked at it, it's like, no, we're finding the same thing. So it, it is surprising. And that's why, I mean, this is uh, quite intriguing and it, it would seem to be telling us perhaps something could be completeness. I mean, could be that we just don't have enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but but if not, we were we were thinking, well, then maybe there is there needs to be there's like a, a, a threshold or something like that for the instability to take place to 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 appear as a bar. But we need to look at this a little bit more, especially. I'm interested in knowing also if stronger bars, I, I would expect stronger bars since we know that they grow in time. Mm -hmm. I would expect them to become more massive too in time, but we haven't actually made that uh, cut uh, to actually look at so, that. But, but do you have ideas? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we found something different, but for massive galaxies using the uh -huh. stone. For the slow okay. galaxies uh, with masses larger than 10 to the 9, we okay. find shorter, weaker bars in less massive, bluer galaxies. And uh -huh. the, the ah, more okay. massive the galaxy, the, the stronger the bar. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, and we, that, that indicates that there's an evolution from weak to strong bars in time. Yeah, but the reason why I, I, I think it's intriguing this comparison, because it's the, the relative mass is, is the same, the, the, the galaxy total mass is different. But here, for instance, when we look only within the massive galaxies, I mean, at the same time, uh, uh, the ones that uh, appear to involve a bulge, they seem to have a slightly higher relative mass, but I mean, it, it may also be within all within the errors. But um, mm -hmm. if we look at, I mean, usually we will measure uh, galaxy uh, strengths to be different uh, depending on, on Hubble morphology too. So we're still trying to wrap our head around it. I had never looked at uh, mass content uh, between mm -hmm. dwarf galaxies. I had not looked at bars in dwarf galaxies before. So I think that's the distinction that, that mm -hmm. we're putting here into place, but we don't, we don't know what to do with that yet. But uh, uh, I- mm -hmm. And within this uh, more massive sample, do, do you have it segregated by mass ranges? Not only by morphology? Mm -hmm. uh, not yet, but we have that information. I mean, that's something that we can look at. I mean, not yet in the sense that we uh -huh. haven't made the cut, but we have <laughs> we have the masses, so we have the possibility of of, of looking at this. But then, because the idea would be to look at whether this uh, this ratio actually changes within the the massive galaxies. That makes perfect sense to actually mm -hmm. look at this. We haven't looked at it. It's a very natural thing to look at now since we are making a distinction between okay. the massive and the low mass and the massive actually include a whole bunch of 
mm -hmm. different masses, then it makes sense to actually build them. So we'll we'll that's something in the to do list. So okay, thanks. Yeah, and your uh, remind me your name again. Is uh, Bernardo Cervantes? Cervantes. Cervantes. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question and the interest. Thanks, Bernardo. We have one more question from Javier. Uh, hi, Karin. Very interesting talk. Uh, hi, so, Karin. Uh, sorry if, if my questions are uh, a little bit uh, dumb because I'm not an extra galactic person. So uh, the first one is, I didn't get, how do you compute the quenching time scale? So, did uh, you say so? And, that, and that's because I went through it very fast. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me too much. Sorry, I, I didn't actually spend uh, much time. Uh, so what we do here, just a second, let me, ah, sorry. I've actually put you guys, okay, occupying my whole thing and I wasn't looking at my, my presentation. So uh, what we use are this, uh, the, the measure that we, that we do on the, on the spectra is measuring the, the H delta absorption and the, DN, uh, the 4,000 Angstrom break. So mm -hmm. these are very specifically, I mean, they, they, if you go to uh, Kaufman, uh, I don't remember what uh, year, early 2000, mm -hmm. uh, you, or even earlier, perhaps, you actually have very uh, strict uh, um, details on how you actually measure this, because if not, everybody would measure this uh, things differently. Uh, correcting also for the H, if you have some emission in the H delta, et cetera. Um, and you, we assume uh, a very simple star formation history where you just have star formation going on and at a certain moment, it just stops and it, uh, it decays exponentially. And then mm -hmm. what you have basically, and I apologize, I, I didn't actually mention this, so that's why I, I provided very little information. And the, the quenching time scale, so that uh, E-fold uh, uh, parameter is this gamma. And, mm -hmm. and, and basically you have uh, different gammas will actually allow you to, to, to trace whether it's, I mean, depending on which gamma your, your your uh, galaxy seems to be closer to, it'll indicate whether it's slower quenching or faster. Now there's a, if you, if you connect these two, um, I, I did not show you here. I mean, the, the paper is this one, Nogaria mm Calvacante, -hmm. but, but just so that you know, it's basically using, because here it's telling you what happens with a, a 4,000 break with time and here with the H, uh, H delta absorption. But you can actually construct uh, uh, plots of BN4000 and H uh, delta absorption uh, mm -hmm. for fixed colors. So this is only within the green valley that we do it. Uh, it normally would be a cube if you actually do it with different colors. Um, and you actually have uh, this, this, uh, these curves of faster and slower quenching, they actually will trace trajectories, tracks in this, by putting these two guys together and assuming a specific color. And basically, we make these measures. We plot them on that on that uh, graph of the M four thousand and H delta, and basically uh, they'll fall closer to in, in certain regions. There's a very nice <laughs> there's a very nice uh, graph uh -huh. uh, that that Juan put in his paper. It it shows really nicely the different regions. So if if you want, I can, uh, I'll ask Renee, I don't know if Renee can give me your email or something and I'll send it to you because it's clearer to see it that way. But oh. then by measure, by putting those measures into that uh, plot, then we can actually see in which gamma basically it falls. And it, it basically tells you how fast it's going through the Green Valley. But this is the simple assumption that galaxies only quench. So what uh, Camila did uh, was actually add a more complicated star formation history that allows for galaxies to go back to blue. So yeah. it's not mm -hmm. simply this uh, decay, mm -hmm. but it actually allows for more complex uh, star formation histories. It's it's very cool work. This actually has mm -hmm. been more led by my colleague, uh, Thiago uh, Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. So he may actually be giving a talk at some point and then he can tell you more about it. But I can okay. also email you that plot because it's, okay. yeah, That'll I'll put good. it there. Okay, I'll put, it, I'll put it there next time. <laughs> thank you. A, a very fast uh, last question. Um, so you were mentioning that uh, the, the dwarf galaxies uh, have the statistically less uh, bars than the that massive galaxies. Uh, but I will imagine that probably these smaller galaxies, you cannot see them far away because they are low bright. So probably if I didn't use mm -hmm. sampling different volumes and then probably your, your percentage are somehow skewed. 
but but here we're only considering uh, we're only considering the very the very uh, nearby galaxies. So we haven't actually certainly when um, the when you consider the higher redshift, there's a um, there's a plot that I that I put here uh, actually showing the dependence on the. Wait, I'm going the right the wrong direction. It's here. I'm just making you all dizzy. I know, but. Uh, this one here, where you actually see, I mean, how the bar fraction, uh, we need to be very careful with the bar size detection limit. And certainly your bar will not be bigger than your than your uh, galaxy. Uh, so this was actually when when we're only depending on, on HST data, then at, at the, you know, uh, 0.9, and we could only go uh, to this. So you're completely right. The thing that the, the fractions that, I, that I've been quoting, they're only for uh, the very nearby uh, galaxies. And the drop is very significant. There, there are many reasons. This is kind of expected in a way because bars, uh, bars no, um, dwarf galaxies. They're they have they're more dark matter uh, dominated. They usually are very gas rich, especially the S four G ones. We realize that there is a tendency of having more late type bars, uh, late type sorry, dwarf galaxies. Mm -hmm. So there are many reasons. We don't know exactly why they don't have the bars those specifically, but they. When I say that a, a disk will naturally form a bar unless it's too gas rich or uh, turbulent, uh, so dynamically hot or more centrally concentrated, like dark matter dominated, those three things are expected also in, in dwarf galaxies. So we don't know exactly what is going on, but I mean, they seem to be, and the drop is very significant. So uh, there I can point you to, to a very careful work that, uh, that looked specifically at the bar fraction as a function of mass in different uh, mass bins. And this is work by Irwin, 2018, mm -hmm. uh, single author. So, so Peter Irwin did a very careful work and you can actually see that there's a huge drop uh, for the lower masses. He also sees a drop for the higher masses too. That's very interesting too. So, okay. Okay. but, but it, makes, it, it makes sense what you're saying, but in this case, we're only looking that that's not something that is affecting us in that uh, nearby galaxy bar fraction drop for the dark galaxies. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Javier. Thanks, Javier. Uh, question from Osvaldo. Oh, okay. Hi, um, I have a question. Uh, in in this sample, have a galaxies with uh, double bar? We actually didn't look at that, but that's very interesting. Yeah, we we we're only looking at the well. In here, I'm answering. Um, there are two sample, two, two different studies that we're looking at here, but the one where I look at uh, the bar properties, how they change with wavelengths, we're only looking at the primary bar. There are very, various instances where you see the increasing ellipticity, you see it twice, and we know that there's a nuclear bar there. And the work that has been led by my student, uh, by Yasmin, uh, with the mass content, uh, the 2D decomposition only is only focusing on the primary bar, but that's very interesting work to actually do to do a, a, to actually take out uh, take those uh, galaxies that have uh, secondary bars and nuclear bars and see how much mass is in there. We have actually thought just of looking at uh, how much there is uh, how much mass there is in the bulge and whatever is left uh, outside in the residuals because we're just using the 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 two D composition that was made by the team. Um, and you could then argue that some of that could be pseudo bulges, some of that could be secondary bars, uh, but we're not actually making a specific cut for those, but they are there. We know that they are there, so. Okay, okay. thank you. And they're very interesting because they, they seem to be the, 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 the ones that may be feeding the uh, supermassive black holes in the center, so they're very exciting too. Thanks, thank you, um, One last question from Rosa. Thank you, Sundar. Karin, it was a very, very nice talk. Um, I Thank wanted you. <laughs> to ask you if you, if you guys saw anything about pseudobulges. I, I guess I would go a little bit on what I was telling Osvaldo, that we, we haven't been, uh, the, the, the decomposition decomposes just bulges, Cersic index, the Valkular with some variation. There is some variation on the Cersic index. Uh, but we we are not we have not for the moment like gone after specifically pseudo bulges. Again, I mean it is there there are they're uh, uh, highly uh, present when you're talking about bars because bars usually will also cause. Uh, I mean it, it was on the list I didn't mention it, but by moving uh, stars and 
uh, generating gas in the uh, uh, increase of the gas in the center and starburst and all that they also do tend they, they're associated to the formation of pseudobulges although there are people they're very cynical and they're like no that doesn't exist i mean why do we need to think about classic classical bulges are the ones that don't exist all of them are pseudobulges but uh we for the moment we're actually just uh looking at the at the just bulges without any distinction between uh pseudobulges and bulges uh, again is looking at the residuals that we would be attributing uh that extra mass then it could be but it, it'll end up being kind of messed with a um whether it's a nuclear bar or whether it's a, a pseudobulge or maybe an internal uh disc or a lens or something like that but uh we have not been looking at the, at them yet do you have a specific interest on the on knowing how much uh mass for instance the the bar may be well altering those bulges right or i was also thinking uh, about the fact that you said that um, about these galaxies that don't have a lot of interactions. Mm -hmm. I, I ah, personally okay. believe that if you do not have many interactions, you will probably have a pseudo bulge. And if you have many interactions, that favors uh, the formation of bulges. So, so I don't know how, mm -hmm. how much this the kind of analysis would support that view. So I wonder. I I think I I know. So you're referring more when we're when I was uh, showing the work by here that we were talking about the yes that about, I, I mentioned out. So those right. only bars, nothing has happened to them. We actually didn't look at that. And so your expectation would be that then you would have more suitable just uh, yes in this one here because it's more prone to have a lot of secular evolution yes. going on. Yes, and then weak weak bars and unbarred galaxies perhaps would have. Uh, more roundish. Uh, yes, yes. And then, and then, well, you cannot see the end result of a violent process because you are but, seeing uh, things that are mm -hmm. undergoing the violent process. You, but either they're say, happening or, yeah. Yes, but once uh, no, it happens. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. No, I, I hadn't thought of that. And that's so, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I guess in this, in, in these cases, I don't know if we have high, well, no, probably we have a, uh good enough morphology to to do that i don't know it's a very interesting question i had yes, not uh and i also that, don't so. i also do not know i'm not a specialist i'm interested in it uh -huh. in, the, in this but i'm not a specialist if also you you said that you need to have face on things to detect bars not, I, face on, not so, just but, avoiding but not, so, so avoiding i don't know i yeah. don't know what orientation is best to detect um pseudo bulges also I, I don't know if you would have it. So, sort of so there's there's an interest also in not so there. Uh, so uh, you may have heard about this boxy or peanut yes. shaped uh, mm -hmm. box. So very often this uh, also when you uh, do a decomposition, then you have this butterfly uh, mm -hmm. residual that stays. Uh, then you don't want to have just a purely face on uh, galaxy. You want to have some uh, some sense of how it how it looks the width. Yeah, so maybe um, 45 degrees would be good. Yeah, yeah, but we actually, the, the cut that we make is uh, we take everything that is uh, less edge on than 65%. So we act at 65 degrees, sorry. We yeah. actually do go all the way to 65. We try to go a little bit higher sometimes, but uh, yeah, it, it becomes difficult to actually say much about the, um, uh, the bar, but they, they become particularly interesting to look at the the um, the vertical structure of the of the bar if you look at those uh, galaxies but i guess then you would need to make sure that there's a bar there but i'm i'm sure that there must be some interesting work uh perhaps on the suitable just to actually look at the at the vertical construction of of these uh of these galaxies our cut is 65 we're not i don't think we're we're not missing we're not eliminating that many uh, I mean, we're doing a lot, but uh, we try to go as high as we can without losing track of uh, whether we can confirm that the bar is there or not. The, the composition also is very human uh, guided. So they, the, the way that S4G um, uh, did this, this the, the, the team uh, went about this decomposition was like, because if you have a galaxy and you throw it at 40 parameters, obviously it's going to be a great, <laughs> a great fit. You put more parameters and it's going to be a better fit. Um, it was really going for the minimal. So not uh, if it didn't look like there was a bar, a bar was not uh, attempted as part of the fit. But, um, 
but yeah anyway so 65 is what we're using okay so well maybe it would be a nice thing to look into yeah, yeah no very interesting especially the, the thing about the the suitable just I'll, I'll look into that i'll think about that that's very interesting okay, thank you thank Rosa. You. <laughs> thank you thank you okay all the questions and let's thank the speaker again thanks a lot Tari. Yeah. thank you very much my pleasure <laughs> and if you have more questions i mean i have my my contacts there at the end so you can or as rene or anyone there just look me up on google and and ah okay it, it went out sorry <laughs> but thank you very much thank you and have a good afternoon everyone see ya bye thank you karin Gracias, thank you karin. Yes.